All right, and welcome again, everybody, to our the fifth tutoring session for the anatomy. I think we made some announcements um, last time that acknowledged that we are more than 500 registrants across the nation for the anatomy. So uh, really appreciate all of you for being here. That's really awesome and, and great to hear. Um, other than that, um, again, tutoring sessions are going to be this week and uh, additionally a week from now in, on Sunday. Um, I hope everyone has a great holiday season, uh, whatever you're celebrating. Um, but in the meantime, today we're going to be talking about the cardiovascular system. And all three presentations today uh, will be kind of complementing each other in that way. Other than that, the other announcement that I can say is before we promised you all a histology atlas that someone from Drexel University has been working on very diligently. And I can say that that should be on our website sometime this month. Uh, now that we've gotten that finalized. So hopefully that can help you all in your studying as well. So that's all of my announcements today. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Bill Frank to introduce our first speaker. Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome back. Um, our first presenter uh, is back by popular demand, uh, Marquise Winston, who is going to be talking about the anatomy of the cardiovascular system. Marquise is from Colleen, Texas, and graduated from Texas State University in San Marcos, Texas in 2018 with a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology. He then went on to complete a Master of Science in Biology at Chatham University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He is currently a second-year medical student at Drexel University College of Medicine in Pennsylvania. Marquise is interested in pediatric hematology and oncology. And when he's not studying, he enjoys hanging with friends, watching movies, and working out. So without further ado, Marquise, the floor is yours. Uh, hey, guys. Um, I'm just about to share my screen, and then we can get this show on the road. Uh, I don't know why I'm acting like I've never done this before. But there's like the green box at the bottom, share screen. Um, okay, that's what I was looking for. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Mm. Okay. Cool. Can you see my cursor? We can, uh, but we can see in presentation view. So I think if you do a, um, a if you're in presentation mode, and then uh, I think if you right click, maybe it'll take you out of. It'll give you what you're. Can um. That might be different. I don't, I'm not sure if you're on a Mac or not. I Maybe swap on. displays. There you go. You guys are so smart. Okay, let's get it. Thank you. Can you guys see my screen now? I mean, not my screen, my cursor. Okay. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about cardiovascular anatomy. Um, yeah, and my name is Marquise. You got the whole feel. Okay. And so these are the learning objectives. There are quite a few. I won't go over all of them. And I will say that this is kind of like a content dense PowerPoint. So just FYI, if you were getting kind of, you know, disheveled, it is recorded. So you can always come back and look at the slides. Okay, so first and foremost, um, the heart <clears throat> is a muscle that pumps blood to various parts of the body. It is located within the thoracic cavity, uh, immediately between the lungs in a space known as the mediastinum. So that's going to be this space right here. The mediastinum is subdivided into a superior mediastinum and an inferior mediastinum. So this is actually a better picture right here. So the superior mediastinum is up here, and then the inferior is kind of like everything else in the thoracic cavity. And so the superior mediastinum is continuous with the neck region and contains parts of the digestive and respiratory systems and great vessels. The inferior mediastinum is further subdivided into a posterior portion, which is continuous with the superior mediastinum, a middle, medi middle portion, which includes the pericardial sac and the heart, and the anterior portion, which is potential space between the anterior chest wall and pericardium that doesn't contain important structures. So 
Like I said, the inferior median steinum is going to be the anterior portion right here. This is the middle, which is the heart, and then the posterior. And you can kind of see everything right here as well. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some structures of the heart. But now I'm just going to kind of go from the ground up. Um, um, the main cell type of the heart is called a myocyte, which are which is under involuntary control, meaning that we don't have to manually contract or control the muscle. It just does it by itself. Similar to breathing, you don't really think about breathing, you just do it. So that's under involuntary control. Uh, cardiac myocytes also have striations and centrally located nuclei, which is different from striated skeletal muscle, whose nuclei is located at the periphery. Uh, the cardiac myocytes make up the myocardium, and the myocardium is kind of the bulk of the heart. Like when you think of the heart, it's the myocardium. Um, in the picture to the top right, which I've been pointing to, um, was a photo of the human heart cut open, and you can see different muscular structures. Uh, the papillary muscles extend from the ventricular wall to attach to the leaflets of the atrioventricular valves by fibrous strands of tissue called chordae tendinae. So the papillary muscles are going to be right here, and you can see that they're attached to these little structures right here called the cord coordinate tendinae. And these two structures stabilize the heart valves during systole. Systole is um, just contraction of the heart. And so you can see, like I was saying, the papillary muscles attached to the chordae tendinae, and then the coordinate tendinae attached to this right here, which is going to be the valve. So the right atria has thick pectinate muscles, while the left atria have thin pectinate muscles. And pectinate muscles are just like little muscular st structures in the atria that help it um, contract. And you don't, they don't really have it labeled on any of these, but they're going to be in the right atria and the left atria. You also have trabeculae carnae, which are bands of cardiac muscle lining the inside of both ventricles. You can see the trabeculae carnae right here. And then also down in this little cartoon down here. And they're going to be in both ventricles. Um, then there also is a structure called the, um, it was like an, ov an oval depression in the wall of the right atrium um, that during development is open and shunts blood from the right atrium directly to the left atrium. This is called the foramen ovale. And um, like I said, it bypasses, um, it shunts blood from the right atrium to the left atria, bypassing the underdeveloped lung, underdeveloped lungs. And once the child or once the baby is birthed, um, the oval closes, and then the blood goes up and gets oxygenated from the lungs. And you can see that right here. So this is going to be the uh, fossil ovalis, and this is going to be closed. Um, and then there's also a specialized band of cardiac conduction tissue called the moderator band, and this is going to be in the right ventricle, and it just helps with conduction of the electrical impulses. And it's going to be right here and it's only in the right ventricle. Cool. Okay. And so um, there are four chambers of the heart. I'm sure we've all heard of them in which the blood flows. So you have the right atria, the left atria, and then you have the right ventricle and left ventricle. And there are structures that keep blood from backflowing um, into, so they keep blood from the right ventricle from back flowing into the right atria, and these are called valves. And how I like to think of them are they're kind of like doors, and they ensure unidirectional flow. And so there are four valves. We have a tricuspid valve, which is going to be between the right atria and the right ventricle. And so that's going to be right here. And then you have a pulmonary semilunar valve, which is going to be between the right ventricle and the lungs. And that's going to be right here. Then you have the mitral valve or the bicuspid valve. And that's going to be between the left atria and the left ventricle. And that is going to be right here. And then you have the aortic valve, which is between the left ventricle and the aorta. And that's going to be this little guy right here. And so as you can see um, with tricuspid, bicuspid, tri means three and bicusp bi means two. And that just means that there are three leaflets or two leaflets. And so you can see the leaflets right here. So this is going to be tri the tricuspid valve. So one, two, three. Then the bicuspid, the bicuspid valve, one, two. And these valves are going to be made of fibrous connective tissue. So they're a little hard. Okay, so now we're going to be talking about some external structures. Um, the heart is enclosed within a sac-like structure called the pericardial sac, which is made out of simple squamous epithelium. 
the layer of pericardium covering the surface of the heart is going to be the visceral pericardium. So all this, it's actually like on the heart. Um, and the outer wall of the pericardial sac is the pericardium, the parietal pericardium. And so it's going to be this. And the parieto parietal pericardium also has layers consisting of an outer fibers layer and an inner serous layer. And then in between, um, there's going to be fluid floating around called the pericardial fluid. Um, and like I said, that's located between the parietal, the parietal and the visceral layers that allows movement of the heart within the pericardial sac as the heart beats. And then the heart is also covered in fat and that's going to be the little yellow layers that you see or also further known as adipose tissue. There are also coronary arteries that are feeding the heart. And there's going to be these little guys right here. You also have cardiac cardiac veins, going to be the blue guys. Uh, coronary sinus, which is this right here. We're going to be talking about all this soon enough, so don't you worry. And then something that is interesting is this thing called an orcle. Um, it just means the pig, pig ear. And I looked it up, and experts aren't really sure. They're still debating on like the actual function of this structure, but they theorize that it helps with increasing atrial volume and facilitate efficient, fill efficient filling. So, fun fact. Okay, so now we're going to be talking about the blood supply. So the heart receives its blood supply from arteries that originate from directly from the aorta called the coronary arteries. Um, there's a right coronary artery that proceeds along the coronary sulcus. Ooh, so it's going to be this little guy right here. And distributes blood to the right atrium, portions of both ventricles, and the heart's conduction system. And so we have three three main branches that we really mainly talk about, but there are also many other little branches of the coronary artery. And so we're going to have the SA nodal artery, which isn't shown on here, but it um, it feeds the um, SA node, the sinoatrial node, which we're also going to be talking about. And then you have the right marginal artery, which is going to be right here. And then you have the posterior descending artery, which is going to be on the posterior portion of the heart. So if you follow the, the right coronary artery, you follow it, and then you follow it behind the heart, it's going to be right here. And, so, and then you have the left coronary artery, which distributes blood to the left side of the heart, the left atrium and ventricle and the interventricular septum. And so from the left coronary artery, you have two main branches. And so you have the circumflex branch, which is, this is going to be the left coronary artery right here, kind of goes through, and then it immediately branches into the circumflex artery and then it also branches into the left ascending the left anterior descending artery side which is going to which is going to be on the anterior portion of the heart um and these coronary arteries and their branches give rise like i said to numerous smaller branches that interconnect with each other forming anastomosis for continuous blood supply for the heart and what anastomosis is, is just an, er an area where vessels unite to form interconnections that normally allow blood to circulate to a region, even if there are blockages. And so um, up here, it's just kind of like a little diagram. Like if we found that it was kind of difficult to keep up and follow these little guys, it's a better diagram up here. And then I thought this right here was kind of cool. It's an, ang an angiogram. An angiogram is just a way to see arteries and this is going to be an angiogram of the coronary artery. And you can see how it's kind of dilated. And then it's really, really thin and skinny. And oh my gosh, why does it keep on doing that? And that just means that it's a blockage. So I just thought that that was a cool picture for you guys to see. Okay, so for the venous supply, deoxygenated blood from the heart returns to the right atria to get oxygenated via the cardiac veins. Um, there are three main cardiac veins, and they run with a companion artery. And so the great cardiac vein runs with the left anterior descending artery. And like we remember, it's going to be the left anterior descending artery is on the anterior portion of the heart. And so this blue little guy is going to be the great cardiac vein. And then the middle cardiac vein runs with the PDA or the posterior descending artery, and that's going to be on the posterior portion of the heart. And it's going to be the blue guy right here. And then the small cardiac vein runs with the right marginal branch of the right coronary artery, which is going to be this guy right here. And the these veins, um, they dump into this thing called the coronary sinus. 
which is going to be this little big blue vein right here. And then a coronary sinus directly dumps the deoxygenated blood right into the right atria. There's also a vein called the anterior cardiac vein that I don't believe that it's um, that it's shown on here, but this vein drains directly into the right atrium. So it bypasses the um, coronary sinus and dumps the blood right into the uh, right atrium. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the great vessels of the heart. Um, so the inferior vena cava and superior vena cava are great veins that retrieve deoxygenated blood from the body and it dumps it into the right atria. And so right here is gonna be the superior vena cava and this is gonna be the inferior vena cava and it dumps right into the right atria. And the inferior vena cava retrieves blood from the lower half of the body. So like the lower trunk and the lower limbs. And then the superior vena cava um, retrieves blood from the upper half of the body. So like the head, the neck, the upper limbs, and like the trunk via the left and right brachiocephalic vein. And you can't see the brachiocephalic vein, but I'm just gonna ask you to trust me on this one. The right and the left brachiocephalic vein is gonna dump into the superior vena cava. And once the blood is oxygenated in the lungs and, re and, re and it returns to the left atria and left ventricle, the blood flows through the aorta and to the peripheral tissues. And so this is the review. You have the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, aorta. And those are the main, the main guys. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the flow of blood. Um, so before we start, I just want to say that when the heart fills with blood, this process is called diastole. And then when the heart contracts, it's called systole. And the contracting and filling is called the cardiac cycle. And so during the cardiac cycle, deoxygenated blood from the body first enters the right atria, enters the right atria, and then passes, like we were saying, through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. And then from the right ventricle, it goes through the pulmonary valve to uh, the um the pulmonary circulation. And something that I think is really important and that it kind of confused me when I first learned it. Um, when we first learn these things, we think like artery is carries oxygenated blood and veins carry deoxygenated blood. But in this particular instance, the pulmonary artery moves deoxygenated blood and the pulmonary veins move oxygenated blood. And so when it's going to the to the lungs, um, it's getting carried by the pulmonary artery. And then from the lungs going back to the left atrium, it's going to be carried by the pulmonary veins. And then once it gets into the left atrium, it flows from the left atria to the left ventricle, through the mitral valve. And then from the left ventricle, it moves through the aorta to the peripheral tissues through the aortic valve. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the conduction system because the heart just doesn't pump, you know, magically. Well, it kind of does, but anyways. Uh, the heart has an intrinsic system of modified cardiac muscle that regulates rhythmic contraction. And so ryth rhythmic contraction is just your heart rate. Uh, normal cardiac rhythm is established by this thing called the sinoatrial node, which is located in the superior portion, the superior and posterior walls of the right atrium near the SVC or the superior vena cava. And it's going to be this number one right here. And the SA node is the pacemaker of the heart, meaning that it, it establishes your heart, regular heart rate and your sinus rhythm. And then after next, it goes to the atrioventricular node or the AV node, which is located in the inferior portion of the right atria within the atrioventricular septum. And from there, um, the atrioventricular goes to the avioventricular bundle, also known as the bundle of his. And this runs through the interventricular septum, which is going to be this guy right here, dividing into two atrioventricular bundle branches, which we commonly call the left and right bundle branches. As you can see, it's going to be four and five going down. And so the left bundle branch is much larger than the right bundle branch due to the left ventricle having to pump blood to the entire body. And also the left ventricle is just more muscular than the right ventricle. Both bundle branches then descend and reach the apex of the heart where they connect with the Purkinje fibers, which are myocardial conductive fibers that spread the impulse to the myocardial contractive cells and the ventricles. And so once it's, these are going to be the Purkinje fibers kind of going um, surrounding the ventricles. 
and they extend through the myocardium from the apex of the heart towards the AV septum and the base of the heart, ensuring that the entire heart receives impulse. And it says it all right here, sorry. And this also is kind of the whole conduction system. So you can see it starts at the SA node and then it goes to the AV node. But before it does that, you can see the purple is just it, the conduction um, impulse kind of uh, filling the right and left atria. And then once it goes to the AV node, you can see from the purple that it's going down the interventricular septum um, through the bundle of Hiss. And then from the bundle of Hiss, it's going through the Purkinje fibers. And it's the conduction is going through all the myocardial myocytes and the ventricles. And then it pumps or, con or contracts. Oh, no. I had a, oh, okay. There we go. I have a video. Oh. Whoa, 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 whoa. Um, so I just wanted to show you just how it looks in action. And so I'll show it one more time. I don't know if, if someone else can confirm, but I'm only seeing the, I'm not seeing the next slide instead of the. Oh, you're not seeing it? Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. You might have to click on the link, uh, the YouTube link, and then, um, exit sharing screen and then share that new one of the YouTube okay. screen. And then you can go back to your PowerPoint then in the same way. Okay. You see it now? Yes. Okay, beautiful. Your tabs look like my tabs. Oh, uh, <laughs> let's not talk about my <laughs> <laughs> But I do know where everything is, so. <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to show you this little quick video to, so you can kind of just see it in action the conduction system. And I'll show it just one more time. Okay. So let's get back to it. Oh, okay. okay, so now we're going to be talking about cardiac innervation. So the innervation of the heart can cause increases or decreases in the heart rate for various reasons. And this is due to its sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation. So the autonomic nerve fibers that supply the heart are located in the cardiac plexus, which is a nerve network located in this area right here. And so what they say is that it's like the cardiac plexus is kind of either at or I guess superior to the um, bifurcation of the trachea. And so that's gonna be right here. Like this bundle of uh, cardiac uh, nerve, these bundle of nerves. So the sympathetic innervation causes increases in the heart rate and its supply comes from presynaptic neuronal cell bodies that lie in the lateral horn of T1, the T5, which means like the thoracic one and thoracic five spinal cord levels, whose axons ascend the sympathetic trunk to synapse in the cervical and sympathetic ganglia. That was a lot, I know. But um, I couldn't find a picture of the sympathetic ganglia, but like, like nerves come out of the spinal cord and then kind of like go down and up. And so there's little ganglia kind of like on the side of it. And so you have like cervical ganglia, thoracic ganglia. And so that's that. And then the postsynaptic neuronal cell bodies lie in the superior, middle, and inferior ganglia and give rise to cervical sympathetic cardiac nerves. And so these nerves, well, what I should have said before that, so from these, uh, the sympathetic trunk, it goes down to the heart and you can see, you can see cardiac nerves from the sympathetic trunk because it's going uh, up, down, here. Um, and then... Yeah, from the cervical sympathetic cardiac nerves. And the thoracic sympathetic ganglia give off thoracic cardiac nerves. And these nerves innervate the SA and AV nodes to increase the heart rate and innervate smooth muscle of the coronary arteries to cause vasodilation. 
And vasodilation is when the blood vessels widen to allow more blood to flow through them. And during sympathetic input is important because the heart is working overtime. It needs more nutrients to do so. And so the thing that I always kind of, the example that I give is say like you're outside, you're running from a dog is chasing you, you're running from a dog, your heart rate's going to increase due to the sympathetic innervation. And since your heart rate is increasing, your heart itself needs more blood to function. And so the cardiac um, coronary arteries kind of get bigger or vasodilate to get, give more blood to the heart. And so there's a parasympathetic innervation and this causes a decrease in heart rate. So um, these presynaptic neuronal cell bodies reside in a compact collection of cell bodies in the medulla oblongata and the brainstem. And this, these impulses travel in the vagus nerve that enter the cardiac plexus to synapse in the cardiac ganglia. And so you can see the right vagus nerve, the, the vagus nerves going to this cardiac plexus or the cardiac ganglia. And then the postsynaptic neuronal cell bodies reside in the cardiac ganglia and these go down to innervate the SA and the AV nodes to slow down the heart rate. And they also innervate smooth muscle of the coronary vessels to cause vasoconstriction. And so imagine me right now, I'm not running away from anything. I'm kind of just sitting down talking to you guys. So my heart rate doesn't need to you know, go 100 or 150. So it's going kind of chill. And so since it's not, I don't have a fast heart rate, um, my heart doesn't need as much blood supply as it would need if I was running away from somewhere. So the coronary arteries, instead of vasodilating, it's, they're going to vasoconstrict. And that was it. Okay, great. Well, we have some time for questions. Does anybody have questions for Marquise? regarding the anatomy of, of the cardiovascular system or medical school in general. Marquise, if you let me, there were two things I was just going to add to your presentation, but I can do it after um, Zathwika asks her question. Yes, please go ahead. Um, yeah, so I was just curious that when you, so when the heart stops, right, people use defibrillation, I'm pretty sure is what it's called to restart the heart. So when people defibrillate the heart, what is defibrillation actually doing? So from my understanding of it, since defibrillation is just like electricity, so you're kind of like shocking the heart back into working. And mm -hmm. so that. Like, you know, that video I showed you with the conduction of the heart, they're just trying to restart the conduction. And once you restart the conduction, then the heart is able to pump again. That's so is it accurate to say that they are kind of restarting the the synovial node? Is it... I, think, I think so. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sin sinoatrial node. Yes. Oh, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just a, a thing about that, just because it's going to make my sister really happy. Uh, to correct this too, is if you see someone on a TV show and you see them flatlining, it's actually not the time when you would be using a defibrillator as well. Um, it's to correct the rhythm. So um, it could be that the heart is not contracting when it's supposed to be contracting. So the defibrillator is actually going to send a shock to those nodes essentially to reset. Um, so if you find someone that's flatlining, you actually want to do CPR. Do not shock them with anything. So uh, this is an important distinction that you'll probably see a lot of uh, very improperly shown in TV shows. And you can point it out and say, I know that that's not what you're supposed to do there. Got you. Thank you. Yes. So for anybody Question. that's either listening or is going to watch this at some point, what I don't think we described very well, and I'm sure Marquise, if he would had a little bit more time, would go into this. Just wanted to make sure, as he described the coronary arteries and those cardiac veins sitting right on the surface of the heart, which we call the epicardium, they have blood vessel branches. So arteries become smaller, their arterioles, and then their capillaries. Those smaller branches are actually growing into the heart wall, which is why they can provide oxygen and nutrients to all those hardworking cardiac muscle cells. And then the capillaries 
come back up as venules, which are larger, and then they become the veins that sit again on the surface of the heart. So um, just wanted you all to kind of get a sense of that's how we maintain the viability of those cardiac muscle cells. And then this is just a, a kind of me saying what was confusing to me when I first started to learn this. You see all the pictures for the electrical conduction system of the heart colored in yellow and they're in lines. And so we think kind of that they look like nerves. And so that suggests that they are nerves running through. And really Marquis said it and he's exactly right. I just wanted to emphasize this. The electrical conduction system of the heart are just modified cardiac muscle cells that are that are sort of modified to be better at allowing flow of positively charged ions, and they're not as good at contracting as the other cardiac muscle cells around them. So I think that's really important. Oh, and it's cool. Okay, we have a question from Rianne. When you said that the heart was covered by fat, what did you mean? Like it's surrounded by fat. Yeah, so um, there's like fat on the um, on the heart. I guess just to um, to keep it safe. So I know um, depending on you know your BMI, BMI um, you can have either a lot of fat around your heart or not a lot of fat, but there is fat in general, just like on the heart. And maybe I can add the um, epicardium, that visceral layer, that outermost layer that Marquise was talking to all of you about. It's not cardiac muscle cells. It's connective tissue. And so that connective tissue can have a small number of adipocytes or adipose cells. And as Marquise just said, if you have... Um, a high BMI, meaning caloric intake is great and exercise is low, those adipocytes can just increase in number and increase in size. And sometimes when we do the cadaveric dissections of some of these hearts, the amount of fat around them is pretty unbelievable. Was a really good question. Do we have any more from Marquis before we let him off the hook? I can see another question asking about um, keeping preserved adult hearts in containers and whether or not that's something that um, can still be done. Um, so uh, I think the ethics in terms of how that's being done has improved greatly. Um, so in order for that to happen today, someone would donate their body to science and agree that their body is gonna be dissected for the purpose of education or for research. And then that could be done, uh, for example, at a medical institution. And you know that could be where then they dissect out the heart and then they keep it preserved in the jar maybe the dissection on it was really good. And so then you can keep that for actually many years to continue to show people and educate years of students rather than just uh, the one when you first took it out. Okay, we have another question. Go ahead, Shatwika. Um, I was just curious, this isn't quite related to the heart, but I know that when there are blood clots, there are basically drugs like warfarin, heparin, and FIBA used to um unclot like to unclot the factors. So I was just curious how each drug varies and how it has different effects on the clotting and declotting of the blood. Um so I know there are different, like you said, there are different drugs that help like break down the clots. So I believe to break down like clots, you have like thrombolytics. And the, what that means is it literally just goes in, breaks down the clots. And what was your question again? Sorry. 
No, uh, you're good. So basically, I, I'm a, I was wondering how heparin and warfarin like differed and how they break down the clots. Um, so from my understanding, there are different factors in like the clotting cascade mm -hmm. and warfarin. They go and they kind of like block specific factors in the clotting in the clotting cascade. And when they block these factors in the like when they bl block these factors, um, your body's blood isn't able to clot anymore. And so that's a way that like those um, like warfarin and heparin work. But so they're basically like blood thinners. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's exactly what they are. Yeah. So does aspirin have a similar effect to these drugs? Like aspirin? Yeah. Like you were saying, sorry. I don't want no. to you're okay. I was just saying, like aspirin also has blood thinning effects, right? Yes, aspirin is also a blood a blood thinner. Okay, thank you. All really excellent questions. No, so, yeah, that that one made me think a little bit. That was yeah. Uh, hey, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if there are no more questions, I think we can move on. That's okay. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Marquise. Thanks for your expertise and time. Uh, much appreciated. So we'll move on to our next presenter, Mackenzie Blackstock. She's going to be presenting the histology of the cardiovascular system. Mackenzie is from Orlando, Florida and graduated from Auburn University with a bachelor's degree in animal science and earned a master's degree from Vanderbilt University in biomedical sciences. She is currently a second year medical student at the Edward Via College of Osteopathic Medicine in Auburn. When not studying, Mackenzie loves spending time with her husband, Cole, and her dog, Winchester. She loves to cook, she loves Taylor Swift, and she is an avid equestrian. Mackenzie's favorite part of anatomy is gastrointestinal anatomy. So, Mackenzie, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Let me go ahead and my screen share. Okay. Can everybody see the screen? Okay. Okay, and can everybody see my uh, cursor? Okay, wonderful. So thank you for the introduction, Dr. Frank. Um, I'm gonna be talking to you guys today about the histology of the cardiac and circulatory system. So just as a brief overview, our session today is going to provide a summary of histology of both the cardiac and circulatory systems that Marquise just gave you guys a great foundation of the anatomy of. And these systems are extremely important for our body's function as they are responsible for providing oxygen and nutrients to our muscles, tissues, and organs. So we just have two learning objectives today and they are describing the structural composition of the three histological layers of a typical blood vessel and identifying the histological features of the three layers of the heart, which you guys know is the endocardium, myocardium, and epicardium and correlate with their functions. So to start off, here is a longitud longitudinal section of cardiac muscle. And to a good way to differentiate cardiac muscle from skeletal muscle is you can see that these cardiac muscles, they have centrally located nuclei. And then here on this next slide, you can see on this, the sketch image of this uh, longitudinal section, there are these things called intercalated discs. And these are a, another really good way to differentiate the heart muscle from any of our other histological muscles that we'll be looking at. Um, and you can also see these central nuclei a little bit better because this is a more zoomed in image. And these intercalated discs are unique to cardiac muscle. 
and they lie between adjacent cardiac muscle cells and they serve as specialized junctions that aid in spreading electrical impulses and contractile forces from well, one cell to another, which essentially helps the heart beat. And now I wanted to give you guys just kind of a brief overview of the heart versus our other two muscle types in the body. So you can see how these look pretty different, um, but zoomed in pretty close, they may look the same. So here again, with your cardiac muscle, you have your intercalated discs and your centrally located nuclei. And then in your skeletal muscle, you have your striations. And then your smooth muscle is just that, it's smooth. So this is just a good review of comparing your three different types of muscles histologically. So looking at the layers of the heart, as Marquise taught you, there's three layers. And from most superficial to deep, you have your epicardium, your myocardium, and your endocardium. And these are outlined in these red boxes, just so you can see them within the figure. And the pericardium surrounds the heart and defines our pericardial cavity, which is within what the heart lives. And these, you can tell by this figure, it does a really good job at illustrating the unequal thickness in the three layers of the heart. So you can see here that the myocardium is significantly thicker than the epicardium, which is then thicker than our endocardium. And the outermost layer of our wall is the innermost layer of the pericardium. So that is our epicardium. And then you can see here in parentheses, it's the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. Now, <clears throat> starting off with the epicardium, like I just said, it's also known as the inner visceral pericardium and it's fused to the heart and comprises this super la superficial layer of our heart wall. And it is considered to be a macroscopic layer that's comprised of simple squamous epithelium, which can also be referred to as mesothelium. And it has a connective tissue layer that can include adipose tissue. And in this layer is where these coron those coronary blood vessels can lie. So you can see up here on the figure, it is a, um, you can see the epicardium here labeled. And now moving on to the myocardium, this is our middle and our thickest layer. And it's composed of cardiac muscle cells, collagen fibers, blood vessels, and nerves. So there's a lot going on in our my myocardium. And its contraction pumps blood throughout the heart and into our major arteries that then help oxygenate and supply nutrients to our tissues and the rest of our body. And these blood vessels will also help supply the direct myocardium. And then these nerve fibers will also help regulate our heart and our heartbeat. And now our endocardium, our most inner layer of the heart is joined to the myocardium via a thin layer of connective tissue. And it's what lines our heart chambers. And it's made of a simple squamous epithelium, which is referred to as an endothelium. So endocardium has endothelium and is continuous with the endothelial lining of our blood vessels. So this this figure may look a little daunting. Um, I know the first time I saw it, it took me a very long time of sitting with it to really understand what it was showing. Um, but we're just going to trans transition into discussing our blood vessels that carry our blood throughout our body and to and from the heart. Now our arteries and veins, they transport our blood within a systemic circuit and a pulmonary circuit. So you can see up here, we have our pulmonary circulation. And then down here, we have our systemic circulation. And then your key over here is detailing your oxygenated blood and your deoxygenated blood. And just a quick run through of this. So your systemic arteries are your oxygenated blood being carried to your body tissues. Your systemic veins carry deoxygenated blood to your heart. And then your pulmonary arteries carry deoxygenated blood to your lungs for gas exchange. And then your pulmonary veins carry your oxygenated blood to your heart, which then gets pumped into your systemic circuit. So that's just a very brief, rough overview of our blood vessels and their roles in our body. So looking histologically, um, arteries and veins look pretty different. 
Um, but they can also look very similar if you don't know what you're looking at. So I thought that this was a very good histological representation of the differences between arteries and veins. And we're gonna go into a little bit more depth on the next slide in those differences. And I have a couple more figures that illustrate that as well. But I would say the biggest difference that you can see from this image is you can see the thickness of the muscle of the wall of the artery in comparison to the vein. So our arteries, like I just pointed out, they have much thicker walls and their walls are so much thicker because our arteries are a high pressure system. They carry our blood away from the heart. It's usually pumping a lot faster, larger volumes of blood, greater, greater pressure to begin with. And now our veins have thinner walls and their lumen is a little bit more irregular. And now a very interesting feature of our veins is our veins and our limbs contain valves that promote unidirectional flow through the heart. So in an artery, your blood can flow any which way it chooses. However, in a vein, once it goes through the valve, it can't go back. So it's, in, which makes sense because veins are working against gravity. And so they carry our blood to the heart and they are a more low pressure system. And now our tunics of um, these blood vessels. So a tunic is just, a, essentially it's a fancy word for layers. So there's three layers to our blood vessels, much like there's three layers to our heart. And both arteries and veins share these same three distinct tissue layers. And those are the tunica intima, tunica media, and the tunica externa. And those are illustrated here on this image. And you can see it's from the outer to inner, externa, media, and then intima. So we're gonna detail our, those three layers a little bit more. And these figures may look a little daunting, but it's just because there's a lot of labels on them. I'm sorry about that, but the key is down here and we'll make sure I'll touch on each of these terms so you know what lies within each layer and the significance of that. So starting off with our tunica intima, this is our innermost layer and it comprises the end, essentially the endothelial tube of our arteries and veins and they are longitudinally arranged squamous epithelial cells, also known as endothelial cells. And they have an internal elastic membrane, which separates this innermost layer from the middle layer, the tunica media. And they have these endothelins that can help constrict our smooth muscle within the vessel walls, which help increase our blood pressure. And now our tunica media, which is our middle layer, is comprised of multiple concentric layers of smooth muscles and smooth muscle cells. And they have they also have an external elastic membrane that separates them from the external layer, the tunica externa. And then they also have, it's called a vasovasorum, which serves as a nourishment vessel um, for our blood vessel. And then the contraction and relaxation of this layer is what's responsible for changes in blood flow throughout the vessel. So this is our heavy muscular layer that helps regulate our contraction and relaxation. And these elastic fibers, which are within these areas, um, help provide that elast elasticity through the vessels that allow them to have those um, contraction and relaxation, and also keep up with the high volumes of blood that's flowing through them. And finally, for our tunica externa, and this is also known as the tunica adventitia, so both of those terms are interchangeable. So if you see something referred to as tunica adventitia or tunica externa, we're talking about the same thing. And like we said, this is the most outer layer, and it is just a sheet, it's a sheath of connective tissue. It's comprised of fibrocytes, collagen bundles, and thin elastic fibers. And it's the thickest layer in veins, and it's thicker than the tunica media in arteries. And this is what's responsible for holding our vessels in place. So when you're moving around and you're living your life, you don't really want your blood vessels to be 
kind of like noodles all throughout your body. And this layer is what's responsible for keeping your vessels in the places that they're supposed to be. And they also have a vasosaurum to keep them well nourished. And then again, here on these figures, you can see the different layers. So here you have your tunica intima, your tunica media, and then your tunica adventitia or externa. And then these Vs here, you can see those vasosaurum, which are very important for nourishment of the vessels. And then over here, it's pointing out those elastic fibers and then those different separating membranes that exist. And that is all for me. Okay, thank you, Mackenzie. Do we have any questions for Mackenzie uh, regarding histology of the cardiovascular system or uh, medical school life in general? Okay, Nitin, go ahead and ask your question. Okay, so uh, my my question is, um, you said that uh, like for arteries, it can like blood can like technically go like both ways, right? But so like, mm -hmm. does that actually ever happen, or is it just like it technically could? So with our arteries, it it can happen. You don't want it to happen. Um, but it's really with the veins having those, uh, the valves in them, our arteries kind of go top down, they flow top down. So gravity works in their favor, whereas the veins go bottom up because they're bringing blood back to the heart. So that's kind of where those valves come into, um, real importance. So that way you're not getting backflow and not getting blood pooling in your legs. Okay, thank you. Great. Sathwika, please ask your question. Yeah, so I know that in the brain, neurons are wrapped in Malin's sheets to conduct electricity forward, right? So does the heart have a similar glial cell system? From my knowledge, and please, Dr. Peterson, uh, help me out if I misspeak. Um, they do not have like the myelin, like our neurons do. Um, I would equate with the conduction between cells. It's in cardiac specifically to those intercalated discs, which allow the adjacent cardiac cells to communicate much like myelin allows a propagation of a signal down a neuron. Oh, okay. Got you. Thank you. And then I'll just add, because I thought both of those questions were really awesome. So first of all, Nitin, your question was really great. And um, maybe we should just say the following. So when Mackenzie talked about veins having valves and having to move that blood that's not under high pressure, we're on the, the opposite side of the high pressure system, when we're returning blood from the limbs, we need valves in our veins. But up here in our head, our veins don't have valves because they're draining blood back towards the heart. And so that makes things a little goofy up in the head, up in the skull. And it's why sometimes you can get an infection into the venous blood supply that can then be circulated throughout the skull. And that's a problem. And that's all because the veins in our head don't have valves. So that was a really interesting and great question. And then, um, Sathwika, I, I'll just, maybe I was misinterpreting the question you were asking, but if you were asking if there's any kind of support cell or a cell kind of left over from embryology that could lead to the regeneration of damaged cardiac cells, there are. There are some cells um, that are embedded, and we don't have very many of them, in the heart itself that have mitotic capabilities. Usually we say cardiac muscle cells can't undergo mitosis, neurons can't undergo mitosis, but they say about 1% of all of our cardiac cells regenerate every year if you're healthy. Um, and those cells have a name, but you don't have to know those. But I thought too, that was a really interesting question that you asked. Thank you.
Do we have any further questions? Okay, I do have one here from Ryan. So when people say that blood is rushing to one place, like say your head, they mean the blood in the arteries? So it could be, it likely is the arteries, but depending on like, when you think of blood rushing to your head, if you're hanging upside down, um, it could also be your veins. I think I just saw a hand raised, but I can't find it. Uh, Sathwika, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, so I had a question about basophils. So I know basophils are immune cells that basically target um, infections and they're like phagocytotic, right? So I've heard that they have, um, they're being used in treatments for can early detection of cancer. Like how far, do you know if there's any development in the treatment mechanisms for that? I'm going to refer that question to uh, Dr. Peterson, Dr. Frank, Dr. Pascara. Um, we have not, our uh, hemonc uh, block begins in January, so I am not very familiar with that mechanism or using or any studies pertaining to that, but that sounds extremely interesting, and I look forward to learning more about that. Okay. Dr. Frank, do you want to start and then I can jump in or do you want me to start and then you jump in you. and go through Dr. Pascura? What order should we should we do this in? Uh, Dr. Peterson, you have the floor. Okay. So first of all, Seth Mika, um, you're right. Basophils are um, a type of white blood cell. In the grand scheme of all of the white blood cells we have, they're about less than 1%. And they, they don't really have good phagocytic capabilities. So they're not known to be good macrophage type cells. They are known for their ability to release um, granules of histamine and heparin. Um, so they have more of a sort of anticoagulant um, and they're really important in the initial steps of inflammation. So I'm gonna say, I don't think there's a lot of research around basophils and their ability to identify tumor cells. But I know that there's quite a bit of interest in these types of um, white blood cells called monocytes, which become macrophages, which can undergo multiple phagocytic events. And so there's a lot of interest in seeing if there are ways either chemically or through transplantation of these macrophages that are primed to recognize certain tumor cells, proteins that they display. So I, I think that's a really good question. It's really interesting research. And I, I think it's really not at the place right now where it could be an eminent clinical trial in humans, but I know they're doing lots of trials with small rodent animal systems. Got you. Um, I also had one follow-up question to that. So when you said that basophils release histamine, um, I know histamine is a major component in allergic reactions. So are basophils heavily involved in allergic reactions? So this is a complicated answer, and and you have really great questions. So um, that would be true if basophils could leave the blood vessels, but typically they don't. So, but there are cells that can, and there are in fact, sort of basophil-like cells that actually leave blood vessels kind of like for forever and move into our peripheral tissues and they just reside there. And we call those resident cells, mast cells. And they're very important in inducing and then perpetuating um, allergic reactions as are another type of white blood cell called eosinophils. And you may remember we talked about those, wow, whew, almost in one of our very earliest um, anatomy tutoring sessions. But please, Dr. Piscura and Dr. Frank, feel free to add to what I said.
think that was awesome and more than I probably could have added. The only thing I was just going to say is um, for a lot of these things, you think of the main function, and I think that's an excellent place to start um, saying histamine and thinking of allergic reactions. I think that's absolutely where you should be. Uh, but there are also other functions of histamine that, you know, don't have um, as much to do with that. It could help moderate blood pressure uh, in arterial systems, for example. So um, there are some ways where you think histamine in the first key, and I think where you were going should be allergies. I think that's kind of where it's usually talked about. But just keep in mind that a lot of these things can have other functions that are completely unrelated. Got you. Um, also, this might be a little bit um, incorrect, but isn't histamine the level that needs to peak or like it's um, a glucocorticoid, like it's a stress hormone? So not so much. Um, so glucocorticoids are um, more in the steroidal um, category of chemicals. Um, a histamine, again, is um, usually released early on in the inflammatory process. And then if it remains high, it helps perpetuate inflammation. And it does that because it's a really good vasodilator. But like Dr. Pescaro was just saying, this kind of a little off topic, but maybe it will help you better understand how many different functions a single chemical in the body can have. It's not the chemical itself, it's the cell with the receptors for it. That's kind of where all the, the functionality and the specificity comes in. But there are certain neurons in our brain that release histamine, and those are what keep us awake and alert. And so if you think about antihistamines, there's always a disclaimer on an antihistamine that you take for allergy season that it can cause drowsiness. And so now you have it, you know, that wouldn't make sense unless you knew, whoa, there are neurons in the brain that release histamine and they do that all the time during our wake cycle. So that's pretty cool. Oh, got you. Thank you so much. Okay. Excellent questions this evening. Uh, are there any more uh, for uh, Mackenzie or or the tax? Yeah, I'm not seeing anything. And if that's the case, then I think we can uh, let Mackenzie rest and uh, we will bring on our last presenter. Uh, and her name is Emmeline Whitwer. Um, she is going to talk about the embryology of the cardiovascular system. Uh, Emmeline is from Washington State and is a graduate of Rhodes College and a current medical student at Drexel University. She aspires to become a radiologist. In her free time, Emmeline enjoys hiking, playing pickleball and tennis, and hanging out with her cat. Her favorite body system is the cardiovascular system. So this is right in her wheelhouse. So I will uh, give uh, her the floor now. So Emmeline, it's all yours. There we go. I had to unmute myself. <laughs> Let me go back to sharing. Clearly not super tech savvy. Hold on, bear with me one minute. Okay, can you see my slides and hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so thank you for that introduction. I um, also go to school with Marquise who um, did the anatomy portion. And I'm gonna build off of what he and Mackenzie talks about by going through the embryological development of the cardiovascular system. Okay, so these are our lecture objectives. So we're going to um, go over limb rotation and how that affects the adult form and the dermatome pattern of the limbs. 
We're going to go through how the right and left atria are formed how, and how they are separated by the interatrial septum. We're going to describe how the interventricular septum is formed. We will also describe the subdivision of the outflow region of the heart and aortic sac into ventricular outlets, the pulmonary trunk, and the ascending aorta. Lastly, we will explain the differences between fetal and neonatal circulation and the changes that occur in the fetal pattern as a result of birth. So starting out with that first learning objective, real quick, it's um, during fetal development at the seventh week, the upper limbs rotate laterally and the lower limbs rotate medially, both by 90 degrees. And that um, results in the palm facing anteriorly, which we can see here on this image to the right and the thumb will be facing laterally. And I think that helps you remember that the upper limb rotates laterally because the thumb ends up facing laterally. And then similarly, the toe will be more medial because the lower limb rotated medially. So that helps you remember toe is medial. So the limb rotated medially and the thumb is facing laterally the upper limb rotated laterally. And that's both by 90 degrees. And you can see how in the chest and the abdomen, these dermatomes are all horizontal and in, in the same line. The arms and the legs, the dermatomes are more twisting. And that's because of the rotation that happens in the seventh week of fetal development. All these lines aren't, you know, straight like they are in the chest and the abdomen. And that's because of the rotation that occurs. And now we're going to dive into the heart. So we'll go through this um, image real quick. The heart, oh, believe it or not, this is what the heart looks like. Well, this is what will become the heart. At 20 days, you have these two tubes. And then at 21 days, they'll start to fuse so that you have one tube. This is what it looks like at 22 days. And then some rotation will happen. I suggest that you do go try to look at just a couple videos on YouTube just to get um, a good idea of how this rotation happens. Um, it, it is a little bit confusing, but if you're a visual person, there's a lot of videos, um, that you can look at, um, the truncus arteriosus, which we can see here at this top portion will become the ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk, the bulbous cordis, which is right below the truncus arteriosus will become the right ventricle and outflow tracts of the left and right ventricles. And the primitive ventricle down here, it's all color-coded. So this red part, which you can also see in these other um, stages, will become the left and right anterior parts of the atria. Um, oh, sorry, the, the primitive ventricle will become the left ventricle, as makes sense. And the primitive atrium, which we can see down here, will become the left and right anterior atria. And then the sinus venosus, you can see down here at the 23 and 24 day marks, will become the posterior right atrium, the SA node, and the coronary sinus. And you can see how they're down here, but because of this flipping that happens, they end up more up here, which is in line with what the heart looks like after development where the atria are on top of the ventricles. And then it's interesting that here at this 21 day mark, the cells are already working together to create that beating motion, which is pretty phenomenal that that's happening when it just looks like a tube. So I um, drew these pictures just because this was really confusing for me when I was first learning it. Um, this is 
just we've put it into boxes basically the top is the atria and the bottom is the ventricles um this is like what will become the ventricle and then up here we have the splitting of the right atrium and the left atrium so i'm just going to go here and show you this is um, a better looking picture that is showing the same thing the right atrium on top of the right what will be the right ventricle and what is the left atrium on top of the left ventricle. So I've just split this into basic boxes because I think that it's a little easier to learn that way at the beginning. So we're going over how the atria are split by the interatrial septum. And then we'll later go over how the ventricles are split. So right now it's just the atria. So we got the right atrium, left atrium, and we have something called the septum primum that grows down towards the endocardial cushion. And in between, we have a foramen, which means um, basically an opening. A foramen means an opening. So this is the foramen primum. And as the septum primum continues to grow down towards the endocardial cushion, the foramen primum is getting smaller and a second foramen opens called the foramen secundum. And then we'll go one more ahead. We can see as the septum primum completely then makes contact with the endocardial cushion, the only opening left is the foramen secundum. And the pressures in the right atrium are higher than the left atrium, so blood will be flowing from the right to the left. And remember, you want this to be happening because in fetal development, you want to bypass the lungs because we're in the womb, there's no air, um, so we don't need to be sending um, lots of blood to the lungs. So instead of having blood come from the right atrium and go to the right ventricle and then be pumped to the lungs, we are bypassing that through um, this hole here. Then a, um, a second septum grows down and grows up here and starts covering that opening that, that we had. So that is the septum secundum. And it grows over our hole, but the septum primum that's still there is able to be pushed like a valve by this higher pressure in the right atrium. So blood comes here, it pushes and is able to go through to the left atrium. And that opening is called the foramen oval. And Marquise went over how um, when that closes at birth, it um, leaves an indentation called the fossa ovalis. So this is um, getting a more in-depth look at how that happens. So then this is just a summary of what we just went over. Um, importantly, the septum primum grows down with the um, septum secundum, allowing blood to flow from the right atrium to the left atrium. The sorry, the foramen secundum allows blood to flow from the right atrium to the left atrium. The septum secundum grows down, covers that, that foramen, but the um, septum primum is able to be pushed open like a valve, and that opening is the foramen oval. And then here we can see that in a more anatomical image, not just the boxes. Um, this is what would have been, what was the septum primum and the foramen secundum and then the septum secundum and the pushing open of this valve like structure is the foramen oval. Okay, so now we will go over the formation of the interventricular septums and then also the outflow tracts. So um, this is the adult heart here, not the fetal heart, just to um, give you an idea of where we're at. So this is the right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. 
And so far in the fetal heart, what we've gone over is the separation of the atria. But we also need to talk about how the ventricles are separated and then how these outflow tracts, which is the pulmonary trunk and the aorta, how they're formed. So we talked earlier, we said that the um, truncus arteriosus becomes the ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk. So the truncus arteriosus becomes the ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk and the bulbus cordis, just below the truncus arteriosus, contributes to the outflow tracts. So back to our um, boxes, because boxes are simple. Um, we now have the separation of the ventricles. And we do have um, blood flow between the uh, right atrium and right ventricle and left atrium and uh, left ventricle. So that's what these holes are signifying. Blood can go through here. And um, we've created a septum. And importantly, you need to know that there's a membranous portion of the interventricular septum and a muscular portion of the interventricular septum. And the endocardial cushion, which was our pink blob right here, contributes to the membranous interventricular septum. And then um, the spiral septum, which is important for separating the pulmonary trunk and the as ascending aorta, also contributes to the membranous portion of the interventricular septum. And the spiral septum is um, made from neural crest cells and those neural crest cells have to migrate so um, it's important to know what is made from neural crest cells because they have to do migration. Um, when something goes wrong with that process, um, it's good to know what could be wrong in the fetus. And this is something that could potentially be wrong. And you could have an interventricular um, defect, um, an interventricular septal defect, because uh, the neural crest cells contribute to the membranous interventricular septum. And then um, let's go forward. Um, we still need to talk about those outflow tracks. And when I say that, I'm talking about how blood is leaving the ventricles because so far we've um, now made the separation between the atria and the separation between the ventricles. And we need to talk about those outflow tracks that I have been alluding to. So this is a busy slide. So um, I'll just take a minute to discuss what these images are up here. Um, is what we were looking at earlier in the, in the fetal heart. And then this is the adult heart. And if we were to just, if you follow my cursor, just slice the heart right here and open it. Oops, I clicked. If you were to slice the heart right here and open it, you would see these valves. And um, Marquise went over the anatomy of this. So it should look familiar. Uh, the tricuspid valve is here. You can see it there in the section. The bicuspid valve is here, connecting the left atrium and the left ventricle. And then you can see the aortic valve, which is here and here, and the pulmonary valve, which is here, and you can see the pulmonary trunk here. So we said that the truncus arteriosus contributes to the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. You can see this right here in the fetal heart is just one, one tube. But here we have two tubes, so we have to separate those. And the spiral septum is important for separating the two. It grows down into here and then it, it spirals which is another good thing to um, look up on YouTube if you're a visual person. The spiraling allows for the pulmonary trunk to be more anterior and the aortic um, and the aorta to be more posterior. Um, and remember the spiral septum is being made by those neural crest cells. So you always gotta be aware of what's made from neural crest because of um, migration issues that can happen with neural crest cells. And then also the endocardial cushion, um, they contribute to the formation of all four of these valves, as well um, as the membranous portion of the interventricular septum. So um, 
those are also very important in the uh, formation of the heart. So now we're gonna go over um, the ways that the fetus best use, utilizes blood flow because the, the blood flow isn't gonna be, be the same in the fetus as it is in the adult because in the, in the fetus, you're not gonna want to send all this blood to the lungs when there is no air and the blood is coming from the placenta. So here on this left side, we have um, a picture of what would be the um, baby in the womb, and uh, here on the right is the placenta. So um, we'll go over how the heart bypasses the lungs. And two important structures are the foramen ovale, which we went over is created during the separation between the atria. There's also the ductus arteriosus. So when blood is brought in by um, from the placenta coming in, you want it to, well, it'll come into the, sorry, the um, inferior vena cava, it'll come into the heart and then you don't want to send it all to the to the lungs. So when it comes in here, it'll come into the right atrium. Instead of all of it going down into the right ventricle to be pumped out through the pulmonary trunk, some of it will go through the foramen ovale, and then it will enter the left side of the heart to be pumped out to systemic circulation through the aorta. Some of it will come down, instead of going through the foramen ovale, some of it will come down into the right ventricle and they pumped out to the, to the pulmonary trunk. And that's what the ductus arteriosus is here for. So when some of it is pumped down here and pumped into the pulmonary trunk, you don't want a bunch of blood going to the lungs. Also in the fetus, the pressure in the lungs is high because it's not being oxygenated. So this high pressure in the lungs will help this blood go through the ductus arteriosus instead of going to the lungs. Another image of that is here on the left, same, same idea, blood is coming into the right atrium. It's um, passing through, we have the foramen ovale to from the right atrium to the left atrium. And then we have the ductus arteriosus for any of the blood that comes down to the right ventricle coming out through the pulmonary trunk. Instead of going out to the lungs, it will go to the aorta through the ductus arteriosus. Immediately after birth, uh, the foramen ovale will close. And then that small depression that's left that Marquis showed you a picture of is the fossa ovalis. And then the ductus arteriosus will also close so that um, when the baby takes its breath and the pressures in the lungs drop, the blood will come from the right atrium to the right ventricle, go through the pulmonary trunk to the lungs where um, it will be oxygenated. And then Another thing that the fetus has is the ductus venosus. So we want to take all of this oxygenated blood coming from the placenta, and we want it to go to um, the blood that's entering the heart. And the blood typically, I mean, in an adult, the blood that's entering the heart is deoxygenated. It's coming from venous return. And we want to take this oxygenated blood and put it into that venous return so that it can go to the heart and be pumped out to important structures like the brain. Um, so we want to immediately put it into the inferior vena cava where it will go to the heart and go to those important structures. So the ductus venosus, it is allowing the blood to be dumped directly into the inferior vena cava and not have to go to um, like the liver 
Um, I mean, obviously you, you do want a little bit of oxygenated blood going to the liver, but you want most of your oxygenated blood going right to the heart. And the way that the fetal circulation does that is through the ductus venosus. And then again, another image of that is here on the left. This is um, the blood coming from, we have the placenta would be over here, um, coming in and going through the ductus venosus to enter into the inferior vena cava where it can then directly go to the heart. And then after birth, we no longer have any connection to the placenta, like to the mother. We don't have this oxygenated blood coming. So this structure is just not needed anymore. And it um, degenerates because it's no longer carrying blood because we're not connected to mom anymore. It degenerates and it becomes the ligamentum venosum. And now the inferior vena cava in the adult is only carrying that deoxygenated blood to the right side of the heart to then go to the lungs and be oxygenated. And that is it for me. And I will take questions now. Emmeline, I did want to ask you um, in creating the foramen secundum, how does that occur in the um, in that in that um, how is that created by what process? You know, I I will have to tell you, I don't know. Okay. Well, can I give you a word? Maybe yeah. uh, apoptosis. Oh, that sounds that sounds like it would be right. <laughs> okay. Yep. Um, so um, yeah, so um, apoptosis. Sorry, um, is how um, cells, well, cells die. Um, uh, I know, like when your like your fingers will have like webbing. Um, in them as a fetus and that webbing goes away by apoptosis. So it's probably a similar, um, similar idea how you have the frame and secundum opening up through apoptosis. That would make sense. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's, it's more of a programmed cell death as opposed to just pathological cell death. So um, as you had indicated. So just wanted to make sure you got that out there as well. Thank you. Yeah, that is important. I just didn't even think about that, but that, yes, that is important. Apoptosis is how those, is how that foramen opens here. And since you brought it up, Dr. Frank, and since it's kind of related to embryology and to our very first presentation from Marquise, so how the inside of the ventricles become trabeculated with the trabeculi carnii, those kind of webs of cardiac muscle cell, and then leading up into from the papillary muscle, those cordy tendony, that too is all um, regulated by apoptosis. So there's a lot of apoptosis that actually happens in the formation of the heart. And I think, Emmeline, you did a great job of describing this very complicated process. So I, I, I just wanted to verbalize that out loud. Thank you for really an excellent presentation. Thank you. I will tell you guys, I had to teach this. Um, to, like I had to go back and spend the last week remembering it all because it is so complicated. Um, so really take some time and let it sink in because I've I've had to learn it multiple times because it's just so it's so complicated. I know how you feel. Excellent job. Do we have any questions? Uh, uh, yes, yes, we can. Go ahead and uh, ask your question. So I know that um, congenital heart disease uh, can be like detected through fetal echocardiography, like in early stages. So is it possible to also conduct surgeries when babies are in the womb? I have heard that that can happen, but I'm not super well educated on it yet um 
but I do believe that that is a possibility now. Wow, that's so cool. Thank you. It is, and it's um, it's obviously only certain defects of the heart um, can be corrected in that way, and some of them are not necessary. So um, Emmeline was talking about, for instance, something like um, an intra uh, an intra atrial uh, septal defect. Some of those are so small. I remember we were supposed to have some pressure changes in the heart and that foramen oval is supposed to close down to become that fossa ovalis. If it doesn't completely close, that isn't life-threatening. And in fact, an individual can lead a pretty normal life and maybe not even be diagnosed with that um, atrial septal defect until later in life or during really strenuous exercise where that becomes a problem. So there's a whole spectrum of congenital heart defects, some which are life-threatening and have to be really addressed immediately, even before birth or after birth. And some of them um, can be surgically corrected even up into adulthood. So yeah, it's, all of this is so amazing and amazing that we understand it and amazing that we're learning how to manipulate some of these processes to assist people in having a better quality of life. So, yeah. Okay. Excellent question. Do we have any other questions? Okay, Siswicket, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I had one more question. So um, I know that there might be some disorders for babies. Um, is it possible to administer a drug through like um, a diffusion into the placenta? I can't say that I know of a specific situation in which you would do that because I probably just haven't learned it yet. Um, so I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I can look it up. <laughs> we can go to other questions. Maybe I can try to look that up. And, and maybe I'll just jump in and Dr. Frank, uh, Dr. Pascura, feel free to add to this. So for really good reasons, Sathwika, um, the placenta is um, really a sort of... Um, a filtration. It's a selective barrier. There's some things that can cross it, but many, many things that cannot. And and that's a good thing because there, you know, you'd love to think that all mothers are really being careful about what they're ingesting, uh, recreational drug use, you know, use of um, alcohol in their pregnancy. And some of those can cross the placenta. And then again, there are other things like there are very few bacteria that can cross the placenta, but certainly many viruses because they're so much smaller in size than a bacteria is. So I think your question was trying to get at the placenta is really is, so that you understand that it's just a thickening of the endometrial lining of the mother. So getting drugs into the, the placenta would mean that you would have to go through the abdominal, abdominal wall and then the uterine wall, and then you would have to access that blood supply in the placenta without harming the mom and without disturbing the blood vessels that are in the umbilical cord. So that would be a challenge for sure. And anything that you wanted to administer to the mother in the hopes that it would circulate to the fetus may not cross the placenta. And so therein lies kind of the challenge. And then you would also have to think about how the mother's body would metabolize that medication before it could would even get to the placenta. Right. Yeah, the reason why I asked is like I've heard of opiates and so on and so forth ca crossing through to the fetus. So I was wondering if there was any medical therapies that would go that way. But that answered my question. Thank you. Yeah. Think of it kind of like the blood brain barrier. It it's it's a natural way of, of preventing most things from getting through and it selects other things that we do want to get through. So excellent question.
This was something um, that you had gone through, but can you just for everybody, um, since this is the first time a lot of information and again, awesome, awesome job. Those figures that you made are phenomenal. And if you, if any of you didn't catch this the first go around, we're going to upload this to YouTube and you can watch it a couple of times. You can try drawing those out yourself. I think separating them into boxes is just genius to do. That's so great. Um, but to kind of tie a nice bow on it, Emily, can you go back through and just describe, so it's ductus arteriosus in the uh, in the fetus. Can you go through the three major ones that you talked about and what they're called in the fetus versus what they're called in the adult? Yeah, so let's go here. We have the the three major are the ductus arteriosus, the foramen ovale, and the ductus venosus. So the ductus venosus in um, the adult, we could see here, degenerates and becomes the ligamentum venosum. The foramen oval should close, doesn't always completely close. Um, as Dr. Peterson was talking about, some people have an um, atrial septal defect, but when it does close, um, it leaves, leaves an indentation called the fossa ovalis. And then the ductus arteriosus here, connecting the pulmonary trunk and the aorta, that should close. Um, and that, I don't know what the name is for um, for what it becomes, but I know that if it doesn't close, it's called a patent. Um, PDA, a patent. PDA. PDA. But, the, but you do know because it's the same as the, 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 the suffix endings are the same for the ductus venosus becoming the ligamentum oh, venosum. So the ductus yes. arteriosus becomes the ligamentum arteriosum. You knew that. You got right. that. <laughs> Just like <laughs> Harry Potter. <laughs> ligamentum arteriosum. <laughs> I think yeah. it's because like the spells and names are in Latin. <laughs> yeah, it does sound like a Harry Potter spell, doesn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. And thank you. That, that was excellent. Excellent presentation. Yes. Okay. Do we have any, we have a little bit of time. Do you, uh, anybody, does anybody want to ask the medical students, the tutors, uh, any general questions, maybe not related to the cardiovascular system, but just uh, medical school in general or how they get to this point or any bits of advice, you know, please, please feel free to ask. I think everybody's getting ready for the the Eagles and Cowboys game, so they're preoccupied. <laughs> so uh, if there are no more questions, I'm going to give the floor back to Dr. Pescura, and uh, uh, I'm just going to say that I look forward to seeing you again next Sunday for the next session. So Dr. Pescura, you want to close? Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, and if you have any questions, then you can join us right again next week. So again, a reminder that the way our tutoring sessions work, typically the second Tuesday um, or second um, uh, Sunday and the fourth Sunday. And um, due to holidays, we'll be doing this month uh, next week instead of the fourth Sunday. So um, glad that you guys are all here. We're looking forward to that. Um, so next week, we're going to be looking at, I believe it's the um, uh, pulmonary system. Um, and so that will be a nice complement to a lot of the things that we had talked about today. Um, I had also mentioned again that Histology Atlas that uh, Dr. Peterson and one of our students has been working very diligently on. So um, again, that should be expected to be on our website this month. So um, you can you can thank Dr. Peterson and her student for that. Um, I see one more question just asking about resources for the anatomy. So uh, if you go to www.anatomy.org, you can find all of our resources that we, we recommend there. There's a um, learning objectives uh, that you can find there. There's tutoring resources on there for anything that you would need. But we additionally have um, some recommended sources that you could find, one of them being one of our funding organizations, the American Association for Anatomy, has a whole list of pretty much anything that you could imagine needing to learn anatomy, embryology, or histology. So all of that should be... Um, uh, just following a couple of clicks through our website and you should be able to get that. 
Uh, just a reminder to everyone, if you have not gotten the uh, resource to use Toltec, then please, again, either re-register using a personal email address. The fact that you're here is a good sign that you're getting communications with us. Uh, but if you have not received specifically the Toltec information, you can also uh, find their website linked on ours and use that to give them the appropriate contact information to get that updated. Um, so I believe that's all I have, and um, we'll see you next week. And I just wanted to say, hey, Marquise and Mackenzie, also great presentations tonight. Just so appreciated your time and your energy and your expertise and sharing it with the next generation. So thanks again. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. Good night.